Okay. Um, so I have 20 minutes, um, and I have 25 slides. So I'm going to skip a bunch of slides. I had this nice story about why we should use predictions in complicated domains, but I'm just going to skip over that and just assume that, yeah, we really want to use predictions, and you all agree with me. Um, so you got to start somewhere. Um, let's start at deep reinforcement learning. Um, the current research going on in deep reinforcement learning is really steeped in control. There's nothing wrong with that. Control is really cool. It's given us a lot of really cool examples of reinforcement learning working. So in games like Atari, Go, Backgammon, um, Doom, and more general things in Minecraft, you also have a lot of really cool robot type things going on. And then also um, Mujoko, where you see one-legged figures jumping around as if they're walking. Um, also, this has really furthered our understanding of using deep architectures or deep networks with the TD class of algorithms, specifically Q-learning um, in most of the, the examples. Um, but one of the questions that I continually ask myself is, where are all the predictions? Um, we want to make predictions. Predictions are interesting. One thing you can think of is, OK, we're already making a lot of predictions through our training of, of Q values. But what about other things we can do? What about more general predictions um, underneath the class of what we would consider general value functions? Before I get into what I really want to talk about, um, what is a general value function? Uh, it's a mechanism in which we can ask questions about a sense of mortar stream of experience, um, and then also approximate the answers to these questions. Um, you have a question? Oh, so a, a Q value is a, an action state value. And then, um, excuse me for my slang, we usually call that a Q value function. Um, and then a normal value function is just a value function. You can think of a um, value function as like the, the um, average over all actions of your, your action state value function, of your Q value function. I was, I was throwing, throwing slain around, and you called me on it, so thank you. <laughs> um, some, some key features, like I, I assume most of you have been coming to a lot of the talks over the summer, and GVFs has been um, a hot topic that we've been discussing a lot. Um, some of the key features are cumulant, so the things that we consider rewards in a more traditional value function can be any real valued signal that we get from our environment. Um, we have a continuation function, so this really sets the horizon of uh, which we're looking at, or the time scale um, of the prediction. And then often we want our general value functions to be off policy. Um, and I have this belief that off policy predictions are, ha have a lot more power than on policy predictions, and they can give us a lot more information about the world. Um, here are some of the things that are cool that we use predictions for. I'm just going to skip over them. Um, some of the challenges um, we have in complex environments. So complex can mean either all we're getting is visual input. Um, it can mean really high state space that is really hard to interpret for humans. Um, or it can just be something that we can't easily simulate, so like a robot. Um, some of the challenges that I'm aware of, um, and as you can see, I, this is an incomplete list, is the discovery question. So what questions should we actually ask in these high dimensional spaces? What questions are useful to ask about images? per se. No one's done a lot of work on that. Um, another thing that's really difficult, especially in robotic data, um, is how do we evaluate the performance of our system? Do we want it to, to our evaluation to be linked to the control, or do we want to measure how well our predictions are doing? Um, there's lots of questions there. Um, another thing that I've been considering lately is the behavior awareness. Um, and what I mean by this is sometimes we don't have nice, clean data that's been generated by, um, say, an agent that's learned a policy, or we don't have access to that policy. So how do we recover that to be able to learn off policy? Um, that's a really difficult question. Um, but what I'm really wanting to look at today is training. So how should off policy predictions be trained? And with what capacity? And really, it's this first question here. Um, how should off-policy predictions be trained? So there's been a lot of work in off-policy learning. Um, so here is just a sample, a, a really short list sample of all of some of the off-policy 
algorithms that we have. So there's tree backup, retrace, weight important sampling, ABQ slash ABTD, um, emphatic TD, hybrid TD, um, and then TDC and GTD2. Um, I'm not an expert in all of these algorithms. You should see Sina and Benafche for really good comparisons of all these algorithms, and also they're much more ex better experts um, at all of these than I am. And you should also go to um, a paper, multi-step off-policy learning without important sampling. So that's where ABQ was defined. Um, and they have some really good references for what we consider as variance issues. So when I say variance issues, when we include our distribution corrections within the update, that introduces a lot of variance from the important sampling ratio, let's say. And that's been noted several times throughout the literature. Um, can anyone tell me one thing that kind of ties all of these together um, to make off policy or to train off policy? Yeah, kind of. APQ uh, takes out important sampling. But what I was really getting at is that the distribution corrections are in the actual updates of the algorithm. Um, so you have to use something like important sampling. Or um, retrace uses a clipping of the important sampling value. Tree backup just uses the um, target policy values. And then um, ABQ, ETD, and yeah, ABQ and ETD have their own variation of distribution corrections within their algorithms. And I think this is really where the variance problem is coming from. Um, so something that I've been, I've been thinking about a lot is, is this question of, can we remove the distribution corrections from the update? Um, and some of the assumptions that I've made about the problem is we have handed, we, we're getting um, GVFs handed to us. So we have the questions already predefined. Yeah. Um, sorry, could you clarify what you mean by distribution updates? Correction is in updates. Like distribution updates. Yeah, so the distribution correction, so say the important sampling ratio is how we're correcting for the difference in like action distribution of how we're selecting actions, right? And by in the update, I'm meaning, so when we do off policy TD, let's say, we're actually including rho, the important sampling ratio in that update. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we have questions handed to us, so we don't need to consider the discovery problem at all. Um, we have no control over the behavior policy. It's just going to act the way it's going to act, whether that's learned or not, who knows, but we have it accessible. So we have the full definition of the behavior policy that we can gain access to to compute important sampling ratios if we need. Um, and then also, we're using neural networks as function approximator. Um, so one of the things that has been found to be really useful with that for reinforcement learning is the experience replay buffer. So we're assuming that we're going to be using an experience replay buffer. Whether or not you think that's a wise idea, that's up to you. I also don't like the experience replay buffer, but for now it seems like it's here to stay. So let's think about it and maybe we can gain something from it to make learning predictions a little bit easier. Okay, so what I want to do is instead of tackling the main problem, so the problem of how do we correct our trajectories um, or our experience from the environment, I want to I want to step back and look at a simpler problem. So we just have a, we have a data set, D, um, and each set piece of data is sampled according to some proposal distribution. Um, and I call that Q here, and it has a PDF that's well specified. Um, proposal distribution? Uh, so proposal distribution, yeah. So this is um, um, a naming scheme that's used back in like the Markov uh, decision process, like the older um, literature. Um, and that really means is our behavior policy. So it's what we're actually getting our data from, right? Um, so you can think of the proposal distribution as the distribution we're sampling data from. So we're getting our data from that distribution. Um, and we want to retrieve the mean of some other target distribution or the target policy. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the mean. What's yeah. Q? Q is our proposal distribution. Um, so you can think of it as our, our behavior policy in the environment, right? That's one way to think of it. Um, so we want to retrieve the mean, or you want to retrieve some value um, of some target distribution F with also a known PDF. Um, so there's 
uh, several ways that you can go about doing that given um, a data set. The first way is what we usually do in reinforcement learning or what has typically been used in, in reinforcement learning is we um, weight the samples um, and take the mean. So we, we do a weighted mean of the samples to, to get this um, mean value with the important sampling ratio that we're all familiar with, with the target distribution over the proposal distribution. Um, another way we can think about this is we have this data set and we're not getting experience online. So instead of including this important sampled, this important sampling ratio, which could have really high variance depending on how different our two distributions are, we can instead just resample the data from D according to some operation. Um, and so what that operation is, um, so this is from the Smith and Gelfeld, um, Bayesian statistics without tiers. Yes. Um, and they propose two ways of doing this that, that is from the literature. One way is a rejection sampling way where we sample some uni from a uniform distribution, um, U, and we either accept or reject sample. If you were at Wes's talk er uh, earlier in the summer, he did a really good, good job of explaining that and how we can use it in reinforcement learning. Um, one of the things he mentioned though is this M value is really hard to figure out and really hard to tune if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and so what I really want to pay attention to is defining a probability mass function based off of the important sampling ratio. Um, and so really the probability of sampling um, a data, uh, a datum from the data set is this value right here, which is the important sampling ratio over all of the other important sampling ratios in our data set. See, now this looks really familiar to me. Um, and it should look familiar to a lot of people too, because this is how we usually construct PMFs. But what I'm really getting at is, okay, so now we have an experience replay buffer. And it's a storage or a history of our past trajectories given some length. And it's stored. So we almost have this offline data set from which we can sample. And each piece of experience or each transition is this tuple that I have defined here where we have the observation at, at time i, the action at time i, the next observation we get, the reward, and the um, probabilities of selecting the action for the, both the behavior and the target policies. We're in reinforcement learning land now, so they're no longer distributions, we're in policy land. Um, the vanilla experience replay, so the first one really used, is a uniform sampling. So the probability of sampling one of these tuples is one over the size of the buffer. But then we get to prioritize experience replay, which is where I was noticing this similar value before. So what they do is they want to look for things that they think are going to update their network more often. So they're some sampling with a probability mass function with each data's weights or probability of sampling, sampling proportional to this value here, which is the TD error plus some epsilon. I think they have high hopes of um, getting a TD error of zero, but I find that unlikely, but they put the epsilon value there just to, just to prevent uh, divergence. So prioritize experience replay. Well, we can just do this exact same thing, but use the important sampling ratio instead. So really what I'm getting at is something that I'm calling importance weighted experience replay. Um, so we have a batch of experience. So that's our experience replay buffer. But we want to sample, or we have, we have the experience replay buffer, but we want to sample a batch or a mini batch of experience. So it looks as if, it looks like it was um, produced according, according to our tar target policy. So instead of just including the important sampling ratio within our updates and inducing some really high variant updates that could possibly come, especially if policies are very different, we just want it to look like it was from the target policy um, and no longer have to worry about some of the things we have to worry, up, worry about in normal off-policy learning. How do we do that? I've, always, I've already kind of hinted at that. The probability of sampling some transition or some piece of experience is proportional to the important sampling ratio. And really, it's this right here. And we use the same algorithms that they use in prioritize experience replay to 
um, sample this data in big O of, of log of, of the size of the buffer, I'm pretty sure, um, using, using a, a sum tree. All right, and now we just need to update our network parameters as we would on policy with semi-gradient TD, or we can even use nonlinear TDC slash DTD2. I find that really compelling. Yeah, go for it. Your policy is changing, so you think that you have a store in the buffer. So I'm assuming that this number would be with every transition in the buffer. Yeah, so this number is with every transition in the buffer. We're assuming that our, our policy isn't changing in the theory, um, which is what, so the behavior policy in a lot of the literature is that your behavior policy is static. Um, yes, that is, that is something we're working on. Um, intuitively, I don't think it will be a problem empirically, but, um, and I have some evidence to back that up. Um, so, that's why, so that's why you stated earlier that you are not doing control. Yeah. Have we, have, we have some fixed, we can assume we have some fixed policy, but empirically, again, I, I, I said it doesn't necessarily have to be. Yeah? Four minutes. Four minutes. All right, I'm doing good on time. So I've proposed this to you, and let's just see how well it does. Um, so the first thing I always grab to when I'm testing a new off-policy algorithm is, is the random walk. Um, so we have this robot, and he gets a reward if he gets the battery, and if he goes into the other um, absorbing state, he doesn't get a reward, and he's just randomly going between the states. Um, again, we have no control over the policy. But this, get, this allows us to do a really good comparison of lots of different policies really quickly. Um, and so what I do is I have, I have three different um, behavior and target policy pairs here. And I have a sensitivity curve over step size. Um, we're using a tabular representation. Um, what we do is we collect 100,000 samples ahead of time, um, construct our buffer from that, and we only sample 3,200 transitions for our actual training. Um, and then we set uh, our gamma to 0 0.9. Um, and then we do, it, we do this 150 times, average over all of them. And technically, we do include 95% confidence intervals, but they just kind of vanish. Um, so one of, the tr one of the trends that I would like you to notice is that um, as we go from harder and harder things to learn, so you can see here that the behavior policy um, is something that's actually really, really nice. We have equal chance of doing either action. And when we're learning off policy, this is usually something we want, right? We want something that lets us do a lot of exploration, lets us do and see a lot of things. Um, it also helps with the important sampling ratios um, and making sure they're not too high. So the highest important sampling ratio here is going to be two, I think. Um, but don't quote me on that. Um, and then we have the target distribution, or the target policy here. We can see that um, both work pretty well, but as we get to higher um, step sizes, the, our experience replay and important sampling algorithm doesn't do as well. And that's fine. We still have a really nice big um, bowl here. As we move to something harder, so the probability of going left is now 0 0.9, the probability of going right is 0 0.1, and our target is the exact opposite. So we're going to see important sampling ratios of up to nine here, um, which is a lot. Um, and what you notice is that the IWER, so the importance weighted experience replay, almost looks exactly the same in the sensitivity curve as the prior example. And then we see this trend again. As we get to harder policies, the sensitivity curve looks almost exactly the same for importance weighted experience replay, but gets worse and worse for just sampling from the buffer uniformly and using important sampling. Um, so there's two, there's two reasons that this could be happening, right? So the first reason is doing uniform sampling. We're just not getting enough samples for, to actually learn our policies, right? So, so with just the 3,200 transitions that we're getting, that's just not enough. Um, to make sure we, we see the samples that we need to see to train. Also, we're incurring a lot of um, high updates because of the important sampling ratio. Um, you see it really highlighted in the bottom left there where you have um, basically it just doesn't learn um, where it can. So I've, I've 
have tried this with more samples, and this can learn right here um, at this step size, but it takes a lot more samples because the likelihood of seeing the samples that are interesting to our target policy is really hard. Right, I don't have time. I only have one more experiment to show off. Um, so I have Mountain Carm. Um, everyone knows Mountain Carm. Um, but what I care about is a prediction of this. And, and the question I'm going to ask here is, will I hit the wall? So the back wall, if everyone remembers, when you hit the back wall, all of your momentum stops. Within my horizon, that's defined through the continuation fun function, if I accelerate forward deterministically. If we think about what that actually means, um, it's basically saying, am I going so fast that no matter what I do, I'm going to hit that back wall? Now, that can be a really important question to robotic data or some other, um, some other domain. Um, and so the way I set this up is I, I trained my behavior policy. So this was getting um, at the concern before. We do have a changing behavior policy here. But empirically, um, we see that it doesn't seem to matter all that much for the importance weighted experience replay. Um, we still get better performance um, and better early training, so in the first 50,000 time steps, um, and better asymptotic performance here as well. Um, so some of the things to keep in mind here, I didn't do a good job of sweeping over the step size for this example, but I'm using the atom optimizer. Um, so supposedly that should be fixing all of this for me and it should help with all my variance issues and select the best step size for whatever I'm, I'm learning. Cool. So are there any questions about, I guess I can just continue on. So here are some conclusions. They don't matter all that much. Um, importance weighted experience replay seems like it's an interesting approach to using the, um, the experience replay buffer. One of the things that um, I'm interested in looking at is can we, instead of sampling based off of our target policy, can we select another policy that's nicer to sample off of? Still use important sampling ratios, but have this adaptive um, important sampling type algorithm. Um, cool. Thank you. Trying to figure out what's the relationship of uh, weighted important sampling to what you're doing. What's the so um, so weighted important sampling um, does something actually very similar, right? So it brings in the important sampling ratio and then calculates like a weighted version of it based off of the experience it's seen. Um, but that still includes the important sampling ratio within the update. So what I'm doing instead is just removing that entirely from the update and assuming that the samples I'm getting are, are now on policy. Um, so in um, the limit, so it's it, in the limit, our, um, the way we're sampling here is, where is it, is unbiased. So, so we're, we are consistent in the way we're sampling. Um, I haven't done a really in-depth analysis because the first obvious thing to think about when you see something like this is weighted important sampling, but I haven't, I haven't looked at the connection between the two algorithms explicitly yet. I guess mm -hmm. I'm going to say it's experience replay plus important sampling here. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem to be doing that bad. Yeah, so I didn't do a good job of explaining these experiments, maybe. So in the top left, um, we're using an exp so we're using epsilon greedy for both of these experiments to define our behavior policy. Um, 
in the top left experiment is using an epsilon value of 0 0.1. The bottom right is using an epsilon value of 0 0.5. Um, and so I do see a lot of variance in the updates um, in the top left. And when I use traditional gradient, um, just gradient descent to do my updates or like a semi-gradient TD update, I do see it being a lot more variant to the step size. Um, I just don't have those results to show. Okay, I think that I'm still confused. Hmm. Train, the behavior policy is being trained using Q learning. Yeah. That's the, the thing that's, and it has, has epsilon green. Yes. And then, but your policy you're evaluating is a fixed policy. Yeah, the policy, so the target policy is a fixed policy, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, they'll only be like ten or something. Yeah, they'll only they'll only be like like well, it's so it's zero point one divided by three, one over zero point one divided by three, right? So it's thirty, um, and yeah, so it's not too big, um, but using the atom optimizer, which is something that is typically done, it's a lot easier. It's 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 um, we can see that. It's just easier for the atom optimizer to select the step size for us. Um, and we get less variance in our final trained algorithm. One of the things that I don't actually show, but is useful to see, so I actually do run some evaluation. Um, and so what these two charts are, um, it's the same. So left is um, trained on an exploration factor of 0 0.1, so a policy defined by an exploration factor of 0 0.1. And on the right, we get an exploration factor of 0 0.5. But these are evaluated um, on some data that hasn't been seen by the algorithm yet. Um, this isn't the best way to show it at all. That's why I didn't put it in my talk. But what you're seeing is that the importance weighted experience replay has a better just overall function um, that we can make predictions off of compared to the experience replay and importance sampling. Mm -hmm. products of the policy, like the ratios of the policy uh, for all the, the sequence of actions taken up the policy. So, so yeah, no, they're, they're just, we're doing a, um, I can't remember the exact term. So no, they're not the product over the trajectory. Um, so when we're doing continual learning, that doesn't necessarily work out, especially if you have a policy that does go to zero. Um, so this doesn't correct for the stationary state distribution. Um, so if we use just semi-gradient TD, um, it, it will diverge on Baird's counterexample, for example. Um, but if we end up using like TDC or nonlinear TDC um, as, as our training algorithm, it does end up converging on Baird's counterexample. Uh, but so what is the ratio? Like what is the importance weight? Like, is there an intuitive need? Like what is that number for when you have two different distributions? Well, what, so what, yeah, can you ex uh, say your question again? So, um, so there is a number, right? The row for mm -hmm. from the experience data buffer. So, what is that row? So, the row is um, it's your target policy. The so the the probability of taking the action according to your target policy over the probability of taking your action according to the behavior policy. Um, so, there really is no intuition of what that number can be because it it can be infinite. But it is action. Like which action? Is it the last action? So it was the action it took. Um, so, um, so it was the action it took for this transition. So, um, according to the action that I took in this observation. Right, so, so I think we can shrink the experience replay buffer, especially, um, hmm. so, so maybe we should talk offline about this. So in the sample importance resampling algorithm, what they end up proposing is not shrinking the actual data set, but is sampling to the same size of the data set. Yeah, but what I meant is that it's, uh, when you do this resampling step, mm -hmm. 
uh, that has effectively the it's uh, it's as if you had fewer samples. Right? Oh, so right. It behaves as if you had fewer samples because mm -hmm. you know of these non-uniform weights for all the samples. Yes. And so uh, I guess one diagnostic that people use in things like this is to try to compute an effective sample size. Mm. So when you have a replay buffer of ten thousand points, but then you do this resampling thing, and then it might effectively have like two thousand points because of these Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I think. Um, that kind of gets into what we're seeing here with the changes, like how much worse the uniform sampling gets. Um, so I think your question, it really depends on what the difference of the, two, of the two policies are of how big your effective sample is actually going to be. Cool, I think that's time. But are there any last minute questions?